I attempted a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Shield using everyone's favorite Gen 6 mechanic. Okay, second favorite. Wonder trading. Aside from the typical nuzlocking rule set, which I will put on the screen now, the concept is simple. For every encounter I get, I have to immediately trade it away in exchange for a completely random Pokemon. Any duplicates were to be retraded, and I determined that if the Pokemon I received in the trade was above the current level cap, I was allowed to retrade it as well. Oh, also, hacked mons were fair game. What better excuse is there to release them forever than accidentally getting them killed in a permadeath challenge? So without further ado, welcome to the Wonderlock. After creating the British reincarnation of Issy Gill, it was off to complete the intro sequence of meeting our rival Hop and his brother Leon, picking our starter, of which I chose Sobble, prompting Hop to choose Scorbunny, and talking to way too many NPCs. I really wish they'd tone it down with the intro stuff in these games, but Scarlet's intro took me over two hours to complete, so I doubt it'll be shortening anytime soon. After receiving Pokeballs from Leon and finding some conveniently fallen wishing stars in Professor Magnolia's front lawn, we were given our Dynamax bands and sent off to finish out the intro. Along the two routes we had access to, we picked up a Rookity and a Squobit, but don't get too attached, cause these were our first two wonder trading victims. Away the Squobit went, and in came... A Choodle! Amazing! Honestly, a pretty solid mon to have right off the bat, and it's level 25. With the first level cap being only 20, we unfortunately had to trade Choodle away yet again. But first, we tried our luck with our Rookity, getting back what I believe to have been the exact Squovit we had just traded away, and our Sobble who turned into a level 60 Wimpod you're probably beginning to see the issue here. Over the course of the run, this remains somewhat of an issue, ranging anywhere from an instant viable trade to taking 10 minutes to even get close. Eventually though, we sent away our uber overleveled Wimpod, obtaining our first viable encounter of the run, a level three Grubbin named, we'll just call him Bob. I'd really rather not eviscerate that pronunciation. Before long, our Choodle had become a shiny Feebas named Virgil that did not evolve, and a recently received Corvusquire. Uh, somebody new, cool. Vicavolt could counter Nessa and even Leon's Charizard. This is true. But would we get... That's just a f***ing <laughs> shiny Beldum. Huh? Okay, well, it's fake. Cool. So, yeah. This is exactly why I decided to allow hacked mons. I just can't wait to spend the rest of my days with you, Ray the Dot Shop. With an ability patch, too? You shouldn't have. Really, though, you shouldn't have. This is literally illegal, dude. Quick, quick, hide it! My mom's gonna freak if she sees that thing! After a bit of grinding in the wild area, catching a bounce sweep turned Petalil that we will just be calling Tulip, it was off to watch yet another hour of unskippable cutscenes and dialogue. Then, right outside of Modestoke, Hop challenged us to a battle that gave me way more trouble than I was expecting. His score bunny gave me a run for my money, but I managed to make it out with no losses. Along Route 3, I caught a Zigzagoon that turned into... Okay, trade complete. Okay, what do we get? From Pokegens.com, amazing. Fake Pokemon, probably. A shiny Bulbasaur. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? Two hacked shinies already? Well, rules are rules. Welcome to the team, Pokegens.com. Then, just before the first Galar mine, the first death of the run came in in the form of a stupid kid's even stupider bug. You fought well, Tulip. May you rest easy. In the mine, I got a Woobat who immediately ripped the newly applied Band-Aid off, sending us another Petalil. Unfortunately, the dupes clause was still active, so I had to reach raid, giving us a Heracross instead? Did I say that dupes was unfortunate? Sorry, what I meant was, uh, um... Welcome to the team, Horndog. Can I call you Horndog? It seems... fitting. Bead wasn't a challenge in the slightest, and soon enough, I arrived at the first gym. 
After a bit of grinding, trading my Route 4 encounter for a Dreepy that we'll call Greg, and a quick detour to the wild area for a Thunderstone, Ray evolved into a Matang, Bob blossomed into a fully evolved Vicavolt, and the team was ready to face their first real challenge. And Bob's evolution couldn't have been better timed, absolutely mowing down the entire grass gym with ease. And yes, I did allow Dynamaxing in my run, what about it? Just like that, the first badge was under my belt, and it was time to be line for Holbury. Along Route 5, I caught a Spritzy turned Ninjask, also picking up the Gift Toxel that then became a Munchlax, who we named Chompo. Did the Ninjask get a name? Eh, call him whatever you want, he's far from useful. The Team Yelgrunts and Hop all gave me the same amount of trouble, the amount in question being none, besides the fact that Bob almost overleveled, and I made it to Holbury, home of... <laughs> Wait, huh? What? Wait, whoa, whoa, I feel like I just blacked out for a second. Where, where, where was I? Where was I again? Sorry, I... <clears throat> oh, oh yeah, the home of... <laughs> the gym mission was easy enough, and before long, I was stood face to face with Nessa on the battlefield. Bob was able to take down the lead Goldeen, while Pokegens took the field to face down both the Aracuda and Dredna, claiming my second gym badge. But now, the real deciding factor of whether this run would live or not was coming up. Kabu, the fire type leader. With a team of three fully evolved fire types, he's an intimidating foe to say the least. But I was going to do what I could to ensure that the run would live on. Not before having a nice seafood dinner with Chairman Rose, though. How could I pass up the opportunity? Before leaving Holbury for the second Galar mine, I picked up an encounter from the fishing docks in town, receiving a stuffle from the trade, and I named it Nutcracker. She had klutz instead of fluffy, but I was pretty confident it wasn't going to make too much of a difference. Inside the mine, I got a Krogunk turned Galarian Yamask that we'll call Sully, and I took out Bead and the Yell Grunts with no issues, bringing us back out and over to Motostoke. Specifically to the Badu drop in, where I blew Marnie out of the water and went to bed in preparation for my big, decisive battle. Upon heading back out into the world, I strolled to some nearby grass to grind Champo on some low-level mons in hopes of getting his friendship high enough before reaching the level cap to evolve him into a Snorlax, but to no avail. I do realize now that I could have just gone to the wild area and done some camping, cooking some curries and everything to get his friendship as high as I needed it, but I wasn't very smart back then. So I made my way to the stadium. Before heading in, Nutcracker evolved into a beware, and I equipped the team with various held items to assist in our efforts, and so I stepped out onto the field. I led with Sully using Crafty Shield to avoid the Will-O-Wisp that was inevitably coming from the lead Ninetales, only to switch into Champo on a weak Ember. And that is when I realized that I had royally f***ed up. I had used Crafty Shield with Sully so my team would be protected from any burns, since most of them were physical attackers, but I guess I misunderstood the move's description. I thought that it was a safeguard-esque move, putting up a sort of protective layer from status conditions for multiple turns, when in reality, Crafty Shield is more like if Protect copied Safeguard's test answers. Like, yeah, you're protecting me from status, but you're still Protect. It's only gonna work this turn, then that effect is out the window. And that is why, after both Chompo and Nutcracker were burned and my team started to fall apart, the squad was only able to make it through the first two mons, falling to the G-Max Scorch in the back. An absolutely devastating day, but I couldn't just sit back and concede. I had to try again. So after releasing the hacked mons and transferring Virgil to my home boxes, I booted up another save and got to work. After picking Score Bunny to be the first sacrifice to the Gods of Wonder, I got myself a Nicket and a Squovit to serve as further offerings, as well as the Gift Eevee from the Wild Area Station this time around, as a way of maximizing my encounters. Then, after way too many attempted trades, I ended up with a Pikachu, Wooloo, Meryl, and a new Eevee with a sort of je ne sais quoi. In the wild area, I caught a Bunnelby that ended up being a Kabuto in the end, as well as snatched up the nearby Thunderstone in order to get what can only be considered as an unfair advantage. Another fully evolved Pokemon before the first gym? Don't mind if I do. 
The team was mostly assembled, so I took the time to nickname them. Or at least, the ones I could nickname. Presumably some of them had already been named, so those were all a lost cause, but I did manage to get Jito the Wulu and Achu the Raichu, so not all was lost. My crew blasted through the early game picking up Vulpix, the Vulpix, Squeak the Rookity, and Chungus the Applin along the way. Squeak, after evolving into a Corvusquire, was able to sweep through Milo's grass types and I moved forward to Hobury, getting myself a Grand Pio the Seedot and Magikarp the Magikarp in the process. I decided to put these new finds on the team in preparation for the upcoming Water Gym, mostly Seedot since he's grass type and all, which resulted in our dear Grand Pio evolving into a... Pifril? Yeah, I may have taken French in high school, but I'm probably still butchering these pronunciations. Jito also evolved into the very dense looking double, and it was time to take on Nessa. It started as a nice clean sweep, with Achu taking out Goldeen with a single Thunderbolt, moving to the Aracuda. But that was when I had the bright idea to try and get a switch into Pifuel, which resulted in Achu taking a good amount of damage before taking out the fast fish with a Mega Drain from Nuzleaf. That just left Dredna. I had done all this switching nonsense due to the turtle's quad weakness to grass, but all that ended up happening was Nuzleaf getting blasted into next week. Eventually, with a few attack drops from Charm, Azumarill was able to take out the Snapping Scourge with an Aqua Tail, securing my second badge. But it was clear that I needed to put a bit of WD-40 on my hinges if I wanted to stand a chance against the battles to come. Following the battle, I began to make my way back to Motostoke to face off against Kabu for a second time. I got a Feebass that I will not be attempting to pronounce the name of, and failed my Galar Mine 2 encounter. Get this, Shellos. Both over odds. Oh, second DS is doing white two deerling and switches are onto dark rye, I see. I'm experiencing mild shaman PTSD. Oh man. Yeah, that's rough, dude. Water pulse. Okay. Don't confuse me, we're fine. No! No, miss! Miss! No! Damn it. Bead went down in no time at all, and Magikarp finally evolved, turning into Leviator. I've never seen a harder glow up. Like, Magikarp to Gyarados already invokes jealousy amongst Pokemon, I'm sure, but having a name like Leviator is really just the final blow in an already legendary combo. Finally, the French did something right. In the Motostoke outskirts, I picked up a Pawniard that ended up bringing us full circle, being traded for a level 1 score bunny, which concludes all unnecessary mentions of encounters going forward. It turns out there are a lot of encounters in this game, and going through all of them is going to take up way too much time. So from here on out, only important encounters will be mentioned. Just a heads up. What deems the encounter important, you ask? Well, how about you just don't ask, and I'll concoct my own arbitrary classification of important in the background. Got it? Awesome. Sorry, that felt really mean, and I, I want to apologize. <laughs> After arriving in Motostoke, I made my way to the inn where Marnie and I had a quick fight that did result in Jito leveling past the current cap, so our big old ram was going to have to sit out for the next gym. The next gym, of course, being the cause of attempt ones and Kabu. But this time, our squad was more than prepared. With the help of a Rossberry that I found in a random tree in the wild area, Azumarill the Unnamed was ready to blast through the competition. Kabu and I waltzed out onto the field, and the Silver Fox spoke to me with such gusto. He had no idea what was about to hit him. His Ninetales found its way to the battlefield, as did Azumarill. Turn 1, Ninetales sent out a Will-O-Wisp in an attempt to suppress Azu's power, but our blue egg munched on the aforementioned Rossberry, curing his burn. And in one swift motion, Azu pounded on his belly, maxing out his adamant nature, huge power boosted attack, sealing Kabu's fate without the man even noticing. An Aqua Jet on both the Ninetales and the Arcanine brought them to their knees, while a single Aqua Tail took out the G-Max Scorch in the back, concluding the match almost as quickly as it had begun, securing our third Gym Badge. Following my victory in Motostoke, it was time to head over to Hammerlock. Along the way, I picked up a Firestone as well as a Skorupi that ended up turning into a Ryolu that had yet another name that I did not know how to pronounce. I'm really starting to feel bad at this point. It's either I don't know how to say it, 
or the Pokemon doesn't get a nickname. They all deserve so much better. But regardless, after arriving in Hammerlock and bearing witness to your average Rose Bead interaction, I steered to the left in order to talk to this random kid and watch yet another awkward interaction. This one being more of a middle school romance kind of way. But hey, at least he gave me a sweet apple for my troubles, allowing for the previously boxed Chungus to evolve into an Appleton. After some story beats that everyone has seen a million times, I arrived in Stoan side, where a battle with Hop ensued, which was nothing to write home about. Just about as quickly as it had begun, it ended, leading me to the gym battle against Alistair. I blasted through the gym mission, losing the reboot I had gotten earlier along the way, but wasting no time or tears on the loss, pushing through until it was time for the main event. The main event, of course, consisting of me using Dragon Dance five times on Leviator until the move got disabled by a mask, also bringing my attack down to a measly plus four due to Wandering Spirit swapping out Leviator's Intimidate, and then sweeping through the Dream Cosplayer's entire team with a move apiece, a obtaining our fourth gym badge. Something tells me that the early game was the hard part of this challenge. And so next up was the fairy type gym. And thankfully the new level cap was 38. So that meant that this gym was going to be an absolute piece of cake. Yeah, so now I had a metal bird to use in my battle against Opal and it went just about how you'd expect. She didn't even ask me all of her questions, that's how quick I took her out. I was given my fifth badge, then shooed out of the gym, only to be met outside by Opal herself, wanting to go on a date with me all the way back to Hammerlock. Opal, I'm flattered, of course I'll go you little cat, you. Opal, how dare you? I thought we had something, I thought you loved me. <laughs> Moving right along, the next destination was north of Monastoke in the town of Surchester in hopes of obtaining my sixth gym badge. Not much stood in my path, just a quick effortless battle against Hop, a thievil turned combi, and plenty of walking, and I had arrived at my destination. Right on the outskirts of town, I also picked up a snow runt that turned into first a Vulpix, then a Litwick, which was fairly exciting. I had never used a chandelure before, so I was interested to see how it would fare, as long as I could keep it alive that long, that is. After getting through the long, agonizing process that is the Surchester Gym mission, almost losing Jito on multiple occasions as well as Achu once, it was time to get my sixth gym badge. With a roster of Leviator, Achu, Squeak, Jito, as well as Azumarill and a Grimmsnarl I had gotten a while back named Guy, I was more than confident in my team's ability to blast through this gym with little to no issues. I walked out onto the field, took my position, and the battle began with Leviator hitting the field face to face with Melanie's Frostmoth. My massive dragon hit Frostmoth into the yellow with a waterfall before getting hit with a fairly powerful icy wind, also lowering Leviator's speed in the process, meaning that the bug was going to outspeed the next turn. And outspeed it did, setting up hail before being taken out by another waterfall, sending out her Dermanitan. I needed to control this hail, and thankfully I had thought about it ahead of time, teaching Leviator rain dance right before the fight. So I went ahead and used it, as any sensible person would do, and Darmanitan hit our giant serpent with a taunt, completely ruining my plans to control the weather. I would not have expected the AI to actually be smart, so that definitely blindsided me. But what shouldn't have blindsided me was what happened next. Leviator took some chip damage from the hail, and instead of switching him out, as he was at risk to a crit at that moment, I left him in, going for waterfall only to get outsped by the icy gorilla, falling to a critical hit icicle crash. He had been around for so long, since before the second gym even, and this was the treatment I gave him? He had gotten us through so much, the Stoan side gym being the most prevalent, and now he had fallen from nothing more than trainer neglect. I could have given him a much longer, more fulfilled life, but instead let hasty irresponsibility get the better of me. I'm so sorry, Leviator. You will forever be missed, and may your name forever be the most metal shit I've ever heard in my goddamn life. 
Following the team's harrowing loss, I sent in Guy, hoping to take out the killer gorilla with a single brick break. Darmanitan was able to yet again outspeed, launching another powerful icicle crash, which brought Guy below half before his citrus berry healed him back to the green. Brick Brick brought the ape into the red, allowing for me to swap into a Zoomerill, who took a pointless taunt before taking out the alternative indie rock band with a priority Aqua Jet, and out came Ice Q. I proceeded to completely forget about Ice Q's signature ability, sending out a useless Aqua Tail before getting Azu's speed lowered by another Icy Wind. Now that the penguin outsped, it switched gears to the super effective Freeze Dry, taking our blue egg rabbit down to about half. I swapped out for Gaia again taking another two freeze dries before breaking the brick that was Ice Q's body, bringing out Melanie's final Pokemon, Lapras. With Guy sitting in the yellow at 33 HP, I wasn't sure what to do. I could stay in and go for another brick break and get taken out in the process, or I could switch in someone else to take the fall. And ultimately, I felt like Guy was going to be a lot more useful in the long run than, say, Jito here. I know, I know, he's been around for even longer than Leviator had been, but that is exactly the point. Leviator needs company, and who better to join him in the afterlife than one he'd known for all of his time with us. So, I sent in Jito on a max resonance from Lapras, bringing him down to just about half, and raising Lapras's resilience to both physical and special moves in the process. As a final stand, Jito hit Lapras with a reversal doing minimal damage, but that isn't what's important. What's important is that Jito was willing to make a sacrifice. A sacrifice that would save the integrity of the team. A sacrifice that would not only benefit us, but would also benefit the late Leviator. Thank Thank you, Jito, for all you've done. You will be missed. I then assessed my options, seeing if I had anything for getting out of the situation with no more casualties, switching into a Zoomerill to avenge Jito's life. My blue egg took a max geyser from Lapras, retaliating with a soft aqua tail as the living boat completed its final G-Max turn. I, unfortunately, saw no options within my party that didn't include some kind of sacrifice, so I let Azumarill go down on an unnecessary crit ice beam. I'd be more saddened by this if the game had actually let me name the aquatic rabbit, but I digress. Finally, out came Achu to finish off the discount Loch Ness monster with a max lightning. But not before I wasted a turn going for Thunder Wave, since I apparently just like to toy with fate and wish to be smote by the Poke Gods for my heinously stupid and pointless actions. What can I say? I'm a real sucker for danger. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, I'ma be honest, future skinny, please don't do this shit anymore. It makes me sweat a little bit more than is comfortable. All right, all right. I'll try to be good at the game, I suppose. I'm sorry that I stress you out, Skinny. It's all good, Skinny. Just please, no more. Of course, not a problem, Skinny. Anyways, weird meta bits aside, Achu taking out Lapras meant that I had obtained my sixth gym badge with relatively minimal consequence, moving right along to some story beats before making my way to Spike Myth for the next challenge. Not too much happened during this intermission section, minus the fact that I lost Guy to Hop's heavy slamming Snorlax, which is exactly why I didn't mention him until a little bit later. I know, storytelling is key with these kinds of videos, but sometimes I don't want you getting attached to a Pokemon that's just gonna die later in the video. I'm looking out for you, you're welcome. Regardless Regardless, following the many losses the team had just endured, it was time for a makeover. I brought along a combi named Queen Slay, who evolved into a Vespaquin soon after, as well as the Ryolu from earlier, who I will be calling Jonathan, so I don't botch the pronunciation of his actual name. Again, I know I've said this a lot, but I apologize for any and all of these non-English names not being properly represented because I am an uncultured, knowledge-deprived swine. After establishing my new crew, I made my way to the next gym, taking out Marnie's underwhelming team with ease before going camping and making curries for a solid 15 minutes in order to evolve Jonathan into a much more useful Lucario. Soon after, at the ripe level of 41, Litwick the Unnamed evolved into a Lampent before being exposed to a Dusk Stone in order to evolve into his final form, Chandelure. A bit of leveling through candies later, and it was time to take on the Dark Leader, Pierce. 
The trainers leading up to the gym battle ended up being an easy sweep, only running into the somewhat unfortunate problem of Achu overleveling in the final fight before Pierce, but that wasn't anything the team couldn't handle. Especially considering that a random level 16 Feebas was taking the Electric Rat's place, so there was absolutely nothing to worry about. The fight against Pierce was fairly straightforward. I led with Squeak, who got intimidated by the opposing Scrafty, but that didn't seem all that bad, so I left my Ironclad Bird in to exchange a few hits before inevitably taking out Scrafty with a drill pack, bringing in Malamar. From the start, I had planned to take out the Squid with Queen Slay, but I didn't want a hard switch seeing as Vespaquin would likely be at risk to a crit after getting hit on the switch, so I did what I had to do. If you're sensitive to loss in any way, please avert your eyes. After the death heard around the world, Queen Slay came in, taking a strong foul play before retaliating with a quad effective attack order, moving us along to the next Mon, Obstagoon. Queen Slay got off a toxic, even through the bipedal weasels obstruct, begging the question of what obstruct even does, before switching into Chungus for some signature Appleton stall strats. And before you scurry on down to the comments, I know what Obstruct does. I understand its viability. It was a joke, and I'm sorry you didn't get it. Eventually, the Goonster went down to the combination of Toxic and Leech Seed, bringing in Piers' final Pokemon, Skuntank. I switched into Jonathan, expecting a Toxic from the Edgy Skunk, only to be met by an equally useless Sucker Punch, allowing for me to set up a few nasty plots. The unpleasantly scented rodent caught onto my avoidance strategy, hitting Johnny with a screech. The following turn, I went for a boosted Aura Sphere, getting hit by an unexpectedly powerful Sucker Punch before taking down Pierce's ace, scoring myself my seventh gym badge. After a bit of story that I really couldn't care less about, it was time to figure out the team composition for Raihan. I had some options in the box, but there was one in particular that caught my eye. Evoli, the French Eevee from long ago that had essentially never been touched. It was definitely a solid pick, it just also begged the question of which evolution I wanted, if not needed, the most. The team already had electric, fire, and grass covered, so those options seemed off the table. Against Raihan's team, an ice type could definitely come in handy, but if we're being honest, Glaceon leaves a lot to be desired. Don't get me wrong, I love Glaceon and the 130 base special attack is tempting, but ice types in general are kinda lackluster due to their fragility. Ice would be really nice though. Wait, ice type moves while not possessing what is arguably the worst type in the game and also maintaining a fair amount of bulk? I think I've got it. On a completely unrelated note, I just remembered a fun fact that I feel needs sharing. Did you know that with my newly obtained Aquali, yes, that is French for Vaporeon, and yes, I love it, all that needed to be done was getting the aquatic cat dog thing to the level cap. So after an endless slew of annoying ass raid dens, I brought the team in to face off against the three gym trainers ahead of the real bout. It was a quick sweep, yet again over leveling one of my mons, being Chandelure this time, but much like Achu before him, it really wasn't going to be detrimental in the slightest. And with that, I entered the fight against Raihan with Aquali and Jonathan leading the pack. The battle began, Raihan sending in his lead Flygon and Gigalith, setting up Sandstorm via Gigalith's Sandstream ability. Flygon started by hitting Aquali with a nasty Thunder Punch, bringing my Rule 34 victim down to just over half, followed by Johnny hitting Gigalith with a strong Aura Sphere, tanking the rock's HP into the yellow. I had Aquali set up an Aqua Ring to ensure some extra recovery in addition to his held leftovers, while Gigalith set up Stealth Rock, making this fight a bit more annoying, but nothing my team couldn't work around. After Sandstorm Chip, Leftovers, and Aqua Ring recovery, the first turn repeated itself, Thunder Punch bringing Aquali deep into the yellow, and Aura Sphere taking out the Sentient Rock formation. I then made the decision to boost Aquali's defense with Acid Armor, followed by the Sandstorm Leftovers Aqua Ring process, leaving my Murkat at just 52 HP, and out came Raihan's third mod, Sanaconda. I assumed the snake would try and take advantage of Johnny's weakness to ground, so I swapped into Squeak to avoid such a thing entirely, taking a bit of chip from Stealth Rock. Flygon then revved up for a third Thunder Punch on Aquali. Now as long as this one doesn't crit, Aquali's defense boost should get him through. The Thunder Punch comes out. 
and Aquilee lives on just 10 HP. Sanaconda whiffed an earth power as expected, and Aquilee sent out a quad effective Aurora Beam on Flygon, taking out the red goggled Antlion with ease, with the added bonus of getting my water treading beast to level 49. Wait, no, 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 no. I, I hadn't even thought about this. Aquilee, I'm so sorry. I should have been more diligent about taking out the Flygon. I should not have let you go down like this. You may not have lived long, but you lived well. Goodbye, old pal. Holy s***! Aqualee lives with only two HP to spare. It's a miracle. Thank God for those extra four hit points from leveling up. Otherwise, I would have lost my bulky boy. After healing back to 26 HP through leftovers and Aqua Ring, Raihan sent in his final Mon, Duraludon, and I retired Aqualee from the fight, sending in Queenslay to take his place, taking way too much damage from Stealth Rock in the process. Duraludon G-maxed, going for a max knuckle on Squeak, raising both of the opposing Pokemon's attack, while my armored avian hit Sanaconda with a somewhat weak drill peck before being paralyzed by the Sandy Snake's glare. And then the following turn, Duraludon decided to exploit Queen Slay's glaring weakness to rock, hitting her with a quad effective max rockfall, sending the queen to an early grave. You served us well, queen. May you live on in our hearts. And of course, the lay, queen. Sanaconda whiffed once again by failing a glare, and Squeak hit the self-suffocating serpent with another drill peck, bringing it within range of one final hit. Jonathan took the late queen's place on the field, immediately dynamaxing in order to tank a plus one max knuckle from Duraludon, only to clap back with a critical hit max knuckle of his own, taking down the skyscraper in one shot, leaving only Sanaconda, who made sure to gain the speed advantage through another glare on Johnny before Squeak got fully paralyzed, only prolonging the inevitable. I swapped Johnny out for Chungus, who took two plus two fire fangs, before taking out the snake with one final dragon pulse, securing my eighth and final gym badge. With all eight badges in hand, it was finally time to make my way to Winden to participate in the Champion Cup. Hop and I hopped on a train that brought us to the middle of nowhere in the frozen hellscape that is Northern Galar, and I made my way to the front gates of Winden with little issue, only almost losing some of my team members a few times. But everyone made it to the city alive, so I'm gonna try and repress all the trauma that those required battles caused me and move right along. I immediately made my way to Winden Stadium, checking into the front desk and taking on Marnie's new and improved team. The new being just a grim snarl, but that's besides the point. I led with Jonathan in hopes of Marnie's lead Lipard going for Fake Out, which would then proc Lucario's steadfast ability, boosting my blue dog speed by one stage, which would enable him to outspeed everything on Marnie's team. I had also equipped him with a Person Berry to counter Marnie's abundance of swagger users. But when I sent out Johnny, Lyperd just went for Nasty Plot before I took it out with a single Aura Sphere. So, yeah. It may not seem all too bad, but it kind of threw me off, so I almost instantly felt the need to get out of there. I am realizing now as I write out the script that Lucario would have outsped everyone but Lipard anyway, so it really wasn't that detrimental that he didn't get the boost, but in the moment, it felt like my plan had completely fallen apart. Scrafty replaced Lipard, so I brought out Squeak in order to not risk a crit brick break on Johnny, taking it fairly well with my plated Passerine. The following turn, I hit Scrafty with a drill peck, bringing the mohawked edgelord deep into the yellow while she retaliated with the aforementioned swagger. In order to avoid any self-hits, I brought in Chungus who took a soft crunch on the switch before having her speed halved by Scary Face the following turn. I then set up a Leech Seed for some consistent damage and recovery, switching back into Squeak as Marnie used a full restore. After a bit of Leech Seed drain, I hit Scrafty with yet another Drill Peck, bringing her back into the red before getting hit with another Scary Face and Leech Seed taking out Scrafty, getting Squeak just about back to full. Marpico then took the field, so I swapped into Chungus on a quad-resisted spark that, unfortunately, paralyzed. Now that Chungus was paralyzed, Marpico started the stupidest combat loop imaginable, just going for flinches with bite to add an extra check to each of my turns. 
Thankfully, I got off a leech seed, marking the beginning of a war of attrition. Bite was only doing so much while leech seed was helping Chungus recover his lost HP. The leech seed recovery wasn't quite enough to fully counter my pie's sustained damages, but using recover any chance that I could made certain that I wouldn't lose such a valuable team member. Eventually, the hangry rat fell to leech seed chip, bringing out Toxicroak. Expecting a Venoshock or Toxic, I swapped back into Squeak, but the frog just ended up going for Swagger instead. To yet again avoid self-harm, I switched into Jonathan while Toxicroak just whiffed a Sucker Punch. I had Johnny use Dig, causing Toxicroak to whiff a Swagger and another Sucker Punch before Dig nearly took out the Amphibian, leaving her with only a Sliver. The following turn, Toxicroak finally landed a Sucker Punch before another Dig finished her off, leaving Marnie with only her Grim Snarl. But when I say this final bout was anticlimactic, I mean it. I had Johnny Dynamax and go for a super effective Max Steel Spike, while Grim Snarl G Maxed, going for something that the world will never know, seeing as I outsped and took out the tangled mess of hair in one hit. Next up on the docket was Hop, but there really isn't much to talk about when it comes to our bout. I was easily able to dispose of his entire team with ease. The only mon that caused any issue, if you even want to call it that, was Rillaboom. It was as easy as stalling out all three of the monkeys' Dynamax turns, and the rest was cake. So with that win under my belt, Leon greeted us in the lobby of the stadium, suggesting that we all go get some food and rest up before the finals the following day. Except not, because Leon decided to be a dick and stood me up. I thought we had something special, Leon. But in actuality, the champion had just been whisked away to Rose Tower by none other than Chairman Rose to have a private conversation. Not on my watch. With the help of Hop, Piers, Marnie, and the rest of Team Yell, me and the crew made our way to the tower after obtaining the key required. Hop and I barged in, taking the excessively large elevator up to the top, fighting several of Rose's underlings in double battles before reaching the highest point where we were stopped in our tracks by Rose's side chick, Oleana. She wasn't about to let anyone interrupt Rose and Leon's conversation, initiating a battle to try and stop us. I led with Chandelure as she sent in her most annoying Pokemon, Frostlass. And this is why I say it's her most annoying Mon. If you don't take care of this Frostlass on turn one, you ain't gonna be hitting shit. So this fight was going to be either really easy or an absolute nightmare. The determiner, if Chandelure hits this flamethrower. Come on, Chandelure, I know you can do it. You just gotta melt this frozen siren and all will be well. And Chandelure hits it! With a stream of flames, Frostlass goes down and Oleana's fate is sealed. Her Milotic was easily disposed of by Chungus, Salazzle by Jonathan, Serena by Chandelure, and Garbodor by Squeak, claiming my victory and saving Leon from his very uncomfortably ominous conversation with Chairman Rose. And so, I had entered the final five fights of the game. I re-entered Winden Stadium the following morning to begin the first of these few remaining battles. Nessa being the current obstacle. Out onto the pitch I went and- Ah, shit, I forgot about Bead. Make that six remaining fights. Well, technically at least. In all reality, Bead stood no chance against my team, getting swept by Squeak through the means of clicking Steel Wing repeatedly, minus the Hatterene that I just stalled out with Aquily. So I think I'll just stick with my previous statement of there only being five remaining fights in the game. And now it was actually time for my battle with Nessa. She led with her big bad Golisopod, while I led Achu, who took down the big old bug with a single thunderbolt, sending in Barrascuta as replacement. I immediately switched Achu out for Chungus on what would have been a super effective drill run, instead taking next to no damage from the resisted hit. The following turn I went for Leech Seed, getting hit by an unexpected quad effective Ice Fang in retaliation, bringing my animated pastry down into the yellow, activating her held Citrus Berry, which with her ripen ability and the end of turn Leech Seed recovery, brought her back to near full HP. 
After protecting for a turn to get all the way to full, I decided to stay in on another nasty ice fang that definitely could have taken Chungus out with a crit. So, never punished, I guess? Thankfully though, an apple acid was enough to take out the missile-esque fish, sending in Sea King next. The doofy goldfish threatened with Mega Horn, so after a weirdly unnecessary protect that I'm still trying to wrap my brain around, this was back in March that I did this run, it's September now, please forgive me. I swapped in Squeak who took out the marine marvel with just a few drill pecks, bringing in Pelipper. The big beaked bird never posed any real threat, so I took the opportunity to set up a few acid armors with Aquali ahead of Nessa's physical attacking ace, Dreadnought. After what felt like days of fighting the pelican, Aquali took it out, bringing in Dreadnought. But since Aquali's defense was at plus four, the snapping turtle couldn't do much in the way of damage, going down to a water pulse a few turns later. One fight down, four more to go. Next up was Alistair, but he barely stood a chance. Chandelure outspeeds every single one of his Pokemon except Gengar, so it was a Shadow Ball sweep up until the Living Nightmare emerged. At that point, all I had to do was make some somewhat tactful switches to stall out all three of Gengar's G-Max turns, and I'd be home free. First into Chungus, then into Jonathan on an ineffective Max Ooze, and finally into Aquilee on a fairly weak Max Terror, stalling out the final G-Max turn. Gengar then whiffed to Hypnosis, after which my marine mammal hit the ghost with a water pulse for just under half, confusing him as well. The following turn, Gengar landed a Hypnosis, putting Aquilee to sleep. But that's no problem, I'll just switch out and- Oh no, that's not good. You might have already caught this, but Max Terror has the unfortunate secondary effect of making it so you cannot switch out the Pokemon that was just hit by it. So now I had a sleeping Vaporeon with about a sixth of its HP gone, who was just gonna have to take some hits while I waited for it to wake up. Three turns and three sludge bombs later, Aquilee woke up with just 40 HP remaining, hitting Gengar with another water pulse that left the sleep paralysis demon with a sliver. After leftovers recovery, Aquilee was left with 55 HP, not quite enough to survive another sludge bomb or really anything for that matter. I didn't want it to end like this, but I saw no other way forward. Regardless of everything Aquilee had done for us, regardless of the death scare we've already had with him, I had to let him go. Psych! I can just Dynamax and boost my HP and stats ever so slightly, which will be just enough to tank another hit or two. So I Dynamaxed, and Alistair went for a full restore. Now that's not the end of the world, since two max geysers would take out Gengar no problem, but I just really like making problems for myself, going for a max hailstorm instead, setting up the hail that began doing chip damage on my foe and myself as well. It's fine. It'll be fine. I'll just go for a max guard to block Gengar's incoming attack to get some extra leftovers recovery. And hail still hits me, negating the leftovers recovery I so yearned for. I knew this too, so I don't know why I did it. At that point, the only thing to do was hit Gengar with literally anything and just hope that Aquilee didn't get crit. And so I clicked max hailstorm. Sludge bomb comes out and it doesn't crit. With just 19 HP remaining, Aquilee hit Gengar with a max hailstorm, taking him out and finishing off my bout with Alistair, leaving me with only three battles till glory. Last up in the Champion Cup Finals is Raihan, but this time around, since he has abandoned the double battle format and has opted for weather strats that all counteract one another, he's a fairly straightforward fight. I led with Chandelure almost taking out his lead Torkoal with a single Shadow Ball, getting the special defense drop and leaving it with just a sliver. The Volcanic Tortoise clapped back with a sunny day boosted Lava Plume that did so much damage before being taken down by another Shadow Ball the following turn. Next up was Flygon, so I sent in Aquilee as it switched out the sun for a Sandstorm. After taking some decent damage from an Earthquake the following turn, Aquilee took out the beautiful beast with a quad effective Aurora beam, bringing in Gudra next. Now, this gooey mess of a Pokemon may seem harmless, but 
No, yeah, you're right. It, it's completely harmless. Raihan does have his equip with Thunder, which is very scary for Aquilee, especially when the rain dance that the pile of goop sets up makes the move 100% accurate. But an immensely simple counter to that is just tactfully switching to a Pokemon like Chungus, who quad resists electric type moves, only to swap back into Aquilee on surfs and muddy waters that only help me due to Aquilee's water absorbability. So after another signature Aquilee Chungus stall with the occasional Aurora Beam for damage on the turns that Gudra would waste going for Rain Dance, I took down Raihan's third Mon, moving right along to Turtonator. Not much to report there aside from the spiky dragon turtle changing the weather back to harsh sunlight, causing me to finish him off with an aurora beam instead of a water pulse. With that, Raihan was left with only his Duraludon, G-maxing on turn 1. I hit the skyscraper with a soft aurora beam before taking a little bit of damage from a max rockfall, changing the weather back to sandstorm yet again. Absolutely wild how many times this man changes the weather in a single fight. I swapped in Jonathan on another now quad resisted Max Rockfall before taking down the tower for a second time with an Aura Sphere, taking my place as the top finalist, allowing me to face off against Champion Leon in one final bout. Not before Chairman Rose can come in and really just kill the vibe of course honestly man we all knew you were evil and someone really should have just stopped you way sooner and the fact that you just had to save your dramatics for right before the greatest showdown in the history of galar it really just goes to show what kind of guy you are and spoiler alert it ain't a good look Regardless, after going back to Postwick and obtaining the Rusty Shield, I grabbed an air balloon from Winden and made my way to Hammerlock to face off against Rose and his crazy doomsday antics. The purpose of the air balloon, you ask? I gave it to Chandelure in order to avoid Rose's ace Kaparaja hitting my fragile light fixture with a max quake. So, with my strategy all set, I took the elevator below Hammerlock Stadium and entered the fight against Rose and his steel types. First out was Excavalier, which fell to a flamethrower from Chandelure, bringing out Perserker, who also fell to a flamethrower. Next out was Kling Clang, so I once again went for flamethrower. But the set of gears outsped me? Thankfully, even though the move of choice was a super effective assurance, it only did about a third. Not so thankfully, regardless of how little damage it did, the secondary effect of my air balloon popping was less than ideal. Flamethrower did take out Kling Clang with no issues as well as the following Ferrothorn, but now that Chandelure's air balloon had burst, he was at risk to just about any damage roll from Max Quake. I had to switch up my strategy and fast. The best option I saw was to burn the elephant, which would enable Chandelure to survive a non-crit Max Quake, so I went for it. I landed a Will-O-Wisp, having the attack of the Statue of Liberty's mouse-fearing cousin. Now, I just had to pray. And it doesn't crit, leaving Chandelure at 41 HP, allowing for my ghastly chandelier to make it out alive, sending in Squeak on another Max Quake, avoiding the attack entirely. And after just a few more turns, exchanging weak, resisted hits with the plated pachyderm, I finished off Rose's ace with one last drill pack. The problem that Rose had started was not fully cured quite yet though, as Eternatus had been awoken and was going to cause a lot of world ending problems if we didn't do something about it. Up I went meeting Hop and Leon at the very top of the stadium where Eternatus towered over us all. Surprisingly, the fight against Eternatus almost resulted in the loss of Aquilee, but I made sure to switch out into Squeak on the third Dynamax cannon, only for this physical manifestation of power and the end of days to use Cross Poison on my Steel type. Well, I suppose, regardless of your lore, Game Freak's enemy AI can really only get you so far. The fight against Eternamax Eternatus went even smoother, Zakian and Zamazenta doing basically all of the work. And after I had officially caught the oddly polygonal Mon, I made sure to make one last wonder trade before taking on Leon. Anyway, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna trade our level 60 Eternatus. <laughs> oh, what the heck? Never mind, we can't do that. Bummer.
Well, that was anticlimactic. I really wanted to trade Eternatus out and get like a Yamper or something in return. It would have been a really good bit, but Game Freak strikes again with not letting me have any fun ever. So I suppose all that's left is the final battle against Leon. And after getting everyone up to the level cap of 65 and running some last minute errands, it was finally time. With me, I had Chandelure the Chandelure, holding a spell tag with Hex, Flamethrower, Shadow Ball, and Will-O-Wisp. Aquily the Vaporeon, holding the leftovers with Water Pulse, Acid Armor, Aqua Ring, and Ice Beam. Jonathan the Lucario, holding a Citrus Berry with Dragon Pulse, Nasty Plot, Dig, and Aura Sphere. Squeak the Corviknight, holding a Citrus Berry with Drill Peck, Brave Bird, Steel Wing, and Hone Claws. Chungus the Appleton, holding a Citrus Berry with Leech Seed, Recover, Energy Ball, and Protect. And Achu the Raichu, the very first trade of the run, holding a Scope Lens with Thunder Wave, Thunderbolt, Quick Attack, and Dig. Me and all six of my stepchildren made our way out onto the pitch, and the battle began. I led with Chandelure, while Leon led with his Aegislash. I launched a spell tag boosted Shadow Ball at the opposition, taking it down in a single hit, bringing out Haxorus next. Expecting a super effective Earthquake, I switched into Squeak, avoiding the attack entirely. The following turn, Haxorus went for a resisted Outrage, doing a bit less than a third as Squeak retaliated with a Drill Pack, doing just under half. Since Haxorus was locked into Outrage, Squeak resisted another hit, activating her Citrus Berry, bringing her back into the green. Haxorus became confused due to Outrage as I set up a Hone Clause with Squeak, boosting her attack to ensure another Drill Peck would finish the job. The following turn, Haxorus broke through confusion, hitting Squeak with another Outrage, bringing my bird back into the yellow before another Drill Peck took out Axe Face. Next out was Dragapult, threatening with either a Thunderbolt Bolt or Flamethrower. I had no way of knowing which move it was going to go for, both options being 90 base power, non-stab, super effective moves, so there was no good choice for the switch. I thought it over for a bit, but in the end, I found it best to let Squeak go. A sacrifice worthy of recognition across millennia, I stayed in and Squeak fell to a Thunderbolt from the Ghastly Dragon. You've been with the team since before the first gym, and you've made it this far. Losing you is harder than any that have come before, and I applaud your willingness to do whatever it takes to allow your comrades to achieve greatness. Thank you, Squeak. May you live on in the hearts of many, and may there be scriptures in the years to come commemorating your valiant efforts. See you on the other side. But Squeak's sacrifice was not in vain, as it allowed for a clean switch into Jonathan who, after getting taken into the yellow by a flamethrower, hit Dragapult with a Dragon Pulse, bringing it equally as low. Johnny was not about to take another flamethrower, so I switched into Aquily on another very soft flamethrower. The next turn, Aquily was hit by a fairly weak Thunderbolt that paralyzed. Just. My. Luck. Even more so as Aquily got full parried, forcing him to take another Thunderbolt before knocking out Dragapult with an Ice Beam. Next in was Mr. Rhyme, threatening a super effective Freeze Dry on Aquily, so I brought Chandelure back out, sustaining barely any damage from Freeze Dry, taking out Mr. Fancy Pants with a Shadow Ball the following turn. With only two Pokemon remaining, Leon's only option was Inteleon. Oh. Inteleon? I think you mean the perfect target for Chungus. The apple of my eye came out tanking a quad resisted snipe shot, no problem. All I had to do was click energy ball and wannabe James Bond would be a goner. Oh yeah, I forgot Dark Pulse can flinch. Well, as long as this next one doesn't flinch, the match is as good as mine. And she hits the Lizard Assassin with an Energy Ball, taking out Leon's second to last Mon. That left Leon with one last Pokemon, his ace, Charizard. The iconic Fiery Dragon immediately G-maxed, and I foolishly thought that Chungus could tank a max Airstream, which would let me set up a Leech Seed on the Fire Breathing Monster. So I stayed in and... Oh! <laughs> That's fine. It's, I mean, it's whatever. It's probably best that I have a pivot. So. 
Yeah, I don't know what I was really thinking there. I'm really sorry, Chungus. You deserved a much more heroic death than this, but thank you for your service regardless. I sent in Aquily, baiting out a max overgrowth and switched into Chandelure to capitalize off that read, baiting in a max rockfall this time. I swapped to Johnny to quad resist the hit that caused a sandstorm to begin, chipping Charizard's health ever so slightly as his final turn of G-Max ended. Back into Aquily I went, taking minimal damage damage from a fire blast on the switch. The following turn, I went for water pulse, getting hit by an air slash and getting fully paralyzed. So I did what anyone would do after failure, and I tried the exact same thing again. This time, Aquily broke through paralysis, bringing Charizard down into the red with water pulse before being taken out by the sandstorm. Thank you, Aquily. You contributed so much to the team, and I will never forget you. Down to just three Pokemon in my party, one particular member stood out to me as the perfect finisher. Achu, you beautiful bastard. You started this run. Now how about you end it? Charizard was so low on health from Aquilee's Water Pulse that Leon opted for a full restore. Misplay of the century. Achu blasted the lizard with a thunderbolt, leaving it in the red yet again, and with one final button press, Achu smacked Charizard with a priority quick attack, not only winning us the battle, but the entire run. Now that... Oh, that's crazy. I try my hand at a lot of Nuzlocks, and I don't succeed at very many before just kind of abandoning it and saying, oh, I'll come back to it eventually. So actually finishing one is a huge achievement for me. And I gotta say, the Wonderlock format was a ton of fun. I think I got exceptionally lucky with the trades, both in the sense of how good they were and how few were hacked mons. So that certainly helped. Wonder trading is a super cool and unique feature of these games, and it's a real shame that hackers have taken it upon themselves to squander this otherwise really neat mechanic. Definitely give this challenge a try if you can though. It was a lot of fun and it gives you the opportunity to just trash any hacked mons that you come across. Trust me, no matter how little good it does overall, it feels damn good. Thank you for watching this video and make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. It helps out a whole lot. While you're down there, leave a comment telling me your thoughts on Wonder Trading or just say hi, either way. Also, make sure to check out the streams over on Twitter if you're into that kind of thing. The weekly schedule is on screen now, but make sure to join the Discord for a more in-depth schedule released every Sunday. That's about it for me today, but until next time, as always, have a good one, stay safe, and I'll see you around.